So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ahmadu wa usalli ala Rasulil Kareem, Amma ba'd. Today we're going to talk about Arabic locutions and the history of them. Is Arabic one language? Is it many languages? You know what we're going to do? We're going to use a reference given by Dr. Hani Etchen himself. And, you know, this has happened more than once, that he, re he refers to a book as an authority and a testament to what he's doing. And when I open up that book, it backfires. And I haven't done any videos on that, but this time I'm going to. In the very beginning of his lecture, where he talks about, you know, the Qur'an and whether the uh, the reception of the Qur'an amongst the people of the Prophet Wasallam, he says, in very, you know, he puts the picture of the book reference the author the picture of the author biggest misconception the arabs they spoke one language and then he puts this author there that the author talks about the variations of the language and all that right and and he's you know basically he's trying to say this is a lie the arabic is not one language so that's the reference he gave so let's see what that book actually says Okay, and I'm going to refer to his, uh, you know, testimony that he brings. Oh, look at this scholar. So one of the scholars that he refers to is uh, this scholar here. He wrote a book called Tarikh al-Adab al-Arab. Okay, the history of <coughs> the literature or uh, literary works of the Arabs. Okay. And uh, this scholar, Musta uh, Dr. Mustafa, he's written a thousand-page book. I'm going to show it to you just shortly. A thousand-page book on this issue. So obviously, he knows what he's talking about, right? So let us go ahead and look at some of the things that he talks about in this book. Okay, so uh, Mustafa Sadiq, he refers to him in his uh, the, the talk that he did about uh, Prophet Muhammad uh, speaking... Uh, to the Quraysh and them not understanding the Quran and so on and so forth. Okay, so now let me show you something very interesting. This is the Biqalam Mustafa Sadiq Rafai. Okay, he is writing this, and how does this man, how does this man refer to Allah in the beginning of his works when he's saying Bismika Allahumma, Allah by your name Allahumma? First of all. This, this whole work that he's pointed to is a work, it's, it's, it's a reference actually against him, okay? He uses this work to say what? That there are many Arabics. First of all, let me clear this. Before I go to even what he says, this kind of like the Amiya, if you speak uh, Egypt, uh, you speak Arabic in Egypt, it's different from Saudi Arabia. If it's different from Yemen, it's, okay, that's fine. But what people don't tell you Okay, is all formal writing is the same. All the newspaper Arabics, uh, Arabic of all the newspapers, all the the akhbar, all the uh, uh, the jarira, all the formal writings are always in classical Arabic. Even if the conversation is not any any country that's printing a newspaper, which they all have. All formal writings, all documents, they're not in their colloquial language. Just like English, you know, if you're African American and you're like, you speak, um, you know, your local locution, you say, hey, come to my crib, which means come to my house. Or if you're an Australian, you say, hey, mate, means hey, friend, right? So, but formal writing will always be formal writing. And in the formal writing, uh, it's always fusha, it's always classical, it's standard classical Arabic, it's the modern st standard classical Arabic that's always written down. So, you know, even though these people give this as an evidence, oh, there's so many Arabics. Yeah, there's so many local Arabics, but there's one actual classical Arabic. And anyone who denies that is demented. It's, he's stupid. Because then you just don't know history. Because all the works, I mean, we're talking about 100,000 books, just alone in tafsir, you're talking about five, 600 books, okay, that have been written. What, they don't understand each other? Do they write in a way they can't understand? I've never seen a book in my life of Arabic language that I can't understand. Never happened. So who, who is out there telling me that there are many Arabic languages? I've never received a book in Arabic language I cannot read. 
that's in a different locution than other than classical Arabic, formal writing is always fusha. Okay, so this nonsense that in the street, uh, the the Arabic in uh, uh, Egypt is different from the Arabic in um, when they all read Quran, they're all reading the same Quran. They're not reading according to their colloquial usage. They're not saying, for example, uh, uh, for for Adabu Jahim, right? Or Adabu Jahannam. They're not saying Adabu Jahim. They're not saying Qa, uh, the Gaf instead of the Jim. When they're reading Quran, they're saying everything classically. Okay? And when they're writing, they're writing in a classical way. And when they are doing their newspapers or they're writing anything official, it's always classical Arabic. The person who tells you that there are many, many Arabics and therefore, you know, we don't know what's going on with the Arabic language. And then Dr. Hani saying, oh, there are many Arabics. There were many Arabics in the time of the Prophet. Oh, yeah. Well, let's use this expert who wrote this book, thousand pages. Okay. Thousand page book, more than a thousand page book. Okay, first of all, like I said, he, he starts with Allahumma. So now this person who he brought as a reference to give testimony to himself, meaning Dr. Hani, he's saying Allahumma for Allah. Okay, so this person who knows the entire tarikh, the entire history of Arabic language, knows all of its different variations, which he's going to talk about, because we're going to go over about the first hundred pages, which I've read so far, and there are parts of it that I want to share with you. So now, first point is, he disagrees with you about Allahumma being about Allah or not. Okay, that's very clear. And 99.9999 recurrent percent of the people who know Arabic language disagree with Dr. Hani on this, because his methodology is incorrect. Okay, let's continue. Second point he disagrees with Dr. Hani on, even though Dr. Hani used him as a genius expert. And he put his, you know, unfortunately, when he makes his videos, right, he puts uh, in the very beginning of his notes, no copyright allowed. So if I was to use it, I wish I could use it, but I can't use it because he will then report to YouTube and then put down my video and I don't want that headache. But he puts in the very beginning, you know, there's no Arab, there's no one Arabic language. There are many Arabic languages. This is a mis- uh, this is a wrong idea that there are many Arabic languages. Well, let's see what... And then, of course, everybody knows he's completely against the use of the Bible. Well, well, let's see how this person looks at it from a language perspective. Because, of course, Aramaic and Hebrew and Semitic language like Syriac, they're all part of the same family, also in the same region. Okay? So, he says, Al-Arab ahada shaub samia. Nuh والسلام, according to him, had three sons, Ham, Sam, and Yam. Sam is the one who gave birth to the generations that came to the Arabs. Okay? Nisbahu ila Sam bin Nuh. He, meaning, this is the children of Sam from Nuh. And these are the nations that are, that are mentioned in Tawrat. Okay? Uh, and then he says, in the next, uh, he says, Tasma uh, Samia It is also called Lugatu Samia, Kal Arabiya, Wal Ibraniya, Wal Syriania, okay, Wal Habashiya, Wal Armani, etc., etc., etc. He mentions the different languages that are all part of the Semitic languages. Okay? So, uh, now, this point of his also goes against Dr. Hani and backfires on him because why? Because Dr. Hani maintains that we cannot use the Bible even though his reference of an expert in language is saying no all these languages go back to the Bible and these people that speak these Semitic languages also go back to the Bible. Okay so now let's continue inshallah from there let's look at his next uh, point. So from here now the author, mashallah, he now talks about what is language. And he goes into great detail talking about what is language. Okay? He starts off by a very basic point. lisan. Allah has created the tongue. Wa khuliqat aswat. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created sound. Wa hiya And it is the material 
the basic raw material of language, right? Sound. Even he goes to the point of talking about how animals make sound to communicate. Okay, so he starts from the very idea of sound, and he says even animals have this, and they say things or they make sounds differently to make different uh, types of communication. Okay. So he says that uh, what is the purpose of language? The purpose of language is ijtima'at, is to create society, is to create togetherness. Without language, there's no togetherness. Okay, uh, It is what brings people together, is language. And he says, uh, uh, and the words, what is language? Now he's defining what is a language. Okay. So what is this person's definition of language versus what Dr. Hani tries to tell you? There's many Arabics. Okay. This is what the definition of language that he gives. He gives the definition of language. The person that ha that is listening and the person that is speaking based upon sound, that they understand each other in a meaningful way, this makes lugha. This makes, makes a language. So if... Somebody is a scholar of Islam, like myself, not an Arab. I go to Mecca and I speak to the people there in what I learned as Arabic language. They understand me. That is language. I pick up, pick up a book printed in Beirut, Lebanon, and I read the Arabic book. This book is printed in Egypt that I'm reading from. I pick up another book from Beirut, Lebanon. I read it. I need. I pick up a book from Saudi Arabia. I read it. It's in the language that I understand. The writer or the speaker are saying something, and the sound is coming to me in a meaningful, meaningful way, and I understand what they're saying. It's one language. This uh, was actually what the colonialists tried to do. They tried to uh, divide the Arabic languages in a way that the colloquial language became. Uh, you can say more, they tried to make it more important than the, uh, than the formal classical language. And they succeeded to a great degree because people are not that much educated in classical language, but all formal writings are still done in classical Arabic language. The newspapers, the radio stations. When I went to Egypt for the first time in, at Azhar University, what did they tell me? They told me, listen to the news every day. Listen to the radio station every day because the formal reading, the, the, the words when in buying and selling in the marketplace were very different. But the words in the radio station or in the newspaper were classical Arabic. This is throughout the Arab world. And uh, if you go to the farthest place in the Muslim world, you will find people who speak classical Arabic. So this kind of like, this is different languages? No, it's one language with different locutions. And, uh, but it's all, but what combines all the uh, lo local locutions, the classical ones, is the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, as you will see what this person says. His own, this is the absolute backfiring of Dr. Hani's, you know, expert witness for him. That this person said there are many Arab languages. Okay, let's see what he says. I already said he challenged in one of his lectures about Allahumma. It's not in any poetry referring to Allah. I showed, uh, I showed you how Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet, used Allahumma uh, the, for as the Rabbul Kaaba, the Lord of the Kaaba, the Lord of the heavens and the earth. Allahumma is referring to God, and even you can, you can use Quran to, to determine this. Just. You, you, uh, you know, where uh, uh, if you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they say Allah. So if they say Allahumma fatir is samawati wal Allahumma, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who is that referring to other than Allah? That's Quran, using Quran to make that, that evidence. Okay, so now let's go uh, further. So now, what we know, now we know what language is. Now let's go a little bit further. He says, فَاعْتَبِرُوا Know it. أَصْلُ الْفُصَاحِ The most eloquent. Ismail Ismail was the most eloquent. وَأَنَّ لُغَتَهُ دَرَسَتْ مِنْ بَعْدُهُ ثُمَّ كَانَتْ فِي الْقُرْآنِ الْكَرِيمِ وَبَلَاغَةُ النَّبُوِيَّةِ وَهُمَّ أَفْسَحَ مَا عَرَفَ مِنَ الْكَلَامِ 
Okay, he says that from Ismail came the most eloquent of the Arabic language. So in other words, he makes this point, which I'm going to talk about later, that the Arabs knew what is eloquent versus not eloquent. Okay, they had this very intimate knowledge of what is eloquently said, what is uneloquently said, what is colloquially said, or what is street language versus what is classical language. What is street language versus how you do poetry. They were very aware of this. Okay. And he says the peak of the most eloquent of eloquent of languages, which is, was of Ismail and the people that were from him, his family. And this is why he married into the Arabs. Okay, He married in the Arab tribes. And after marrying into the Arab tribes, they were the most eloquent speakers of the Arabic language. And this is why Quran and the balagh, the eloquence of the prophethood, came from them. Okay, So... He, he's even, even within the Arabs who speak all one language, as he's going to say, I'm going to show you where he says it, but he's saying there is a difference of eloquence. Okay, there's a difference of quality of how you say things. Now he brings up a very interesting topic. So, first he's described what is language. If I say words and you hear words and they have a meaning to you, that's language. Number two, that there is a difference and people can understand the difference between classical language and local language. They can understand that human beings have this quality. Okay. I'm not saying this. This is what he's saying. Okay. Now he's also saying that since we come from the same parents, Adam and Hawa, okay, I don't know if Dr. Hani agrees with that. It doesn't seem like he agrees with that, but if genet we know genes now come from the same parents for all humans, by the way, scientifically. So even though he doesn't agree with it, but scientifically it's a fact. But he says, look, language must also be from what? Okay, there must be one language to start everything off. And he then goes into, well, Nuh had Sam, and they, their language comes from, I'm going to go into the, 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 the Babylonian language and all that, I'm going to go into that. But his point in this fr uh, paragraph here is, look, we have one parents, and there must have been one language, so what was it? And how does it relate to the Arabic language? Okay, this is completely a different uh, methodology or attitude than Dr. Hani has. Okay, completely different. In fact, he gives a simile. He says, تختلف الوان المنطق فيها كما تختلف الشجر الذي يسقى ماء واحد. That the different um, the different languages disagree with they're different. Just like if you give water to one tree, okay, and even though it's being even though the water is one, the source is one, but the fruits will taste different. Okay, so he's seeing language as one source for all humanity. Okay, and he's saying this is how it was from Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. Completely different attitude than Dr. Hani Achin. Okay, let's continue though. And he also says, Asr lughat annaha kana lughat Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. The original language was the language of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. And Dr. Hani Achin, who is using this person as an expert witness, doesn't even think Adam existed. He thinks that the whole world didn't come from one family. So where does the Arabic language itself come from? And then he says, The Asl Sami, from which, meaning from the son of Nuh, from which all these languages came, it comes from the ancient Babylonian language. Now I want to share with you a few things, okay, that are very interesting because he goes into detail about this, but I'm going to show you something that uh, has been prepared by somebody else to show you that if you listen to Babylonian language, the Arcadian language, the ancient Arcadian language sounds very much like Arabic. And he goes into great deal of making this point. And the children languages of this Arcadian language, Arabic, Syriac, uh, Aramaic, Hebrew, they all have the same grammar. And they all have many similar words. And they all 
interact with one another. So let me show you something over here. So this is the ancient Babylonian language reconstructed here. Okay, very close to Arabic language in sound. So, I think that should be enough to make the point. And the other point I want to show, so even though the Arabic language is where it's all green showing here, okay? So it's all where the green is showing is where the proper classical Arabic was spoken. And then you can see Aramaic is the red, the Hebrew is the blue, the South Old Arabian is where the green is. So it's, and the classical Arabic is where the green is, and then the old Semitic languages, okay? So what does that mean? That means somebody from the north, if he came to Arabia, where the prophet was, they wouldn't necessarily completely understand each other. But everyone in the Arab world, where the green is, where Mecca and Medina is, they all understood each other. Okay? So, this is now, because the, it's very important that these languages were interacting with one, one another. It's very important to keep in mind that revelation of Allah, basically the four books came in these Semitic languages. Okay? Over here is an interesting point he says, uh, The language of Adam in Jannah was Arabic. When he disobeyed Allah, Allah took Arabic language away from him. And he was given the Syrianic, Syriania, the Syriac, uh, the Syriac, language and after he did Tawbah the Arabic language was given back to him the point being whether this is true or not or how much weight this has I'm not going to go into that right now but the point is that there is an Islamic uh, you can say many of the Asuliyin and many of the people who study language believe that Arabic was the Arabic was the original language of Adam والسلام, himself. Okay. So now Lam Yapka Ummahatul Lugat, okay, uh Asamiya from Sam alayhi salatu salam, from the child of Nuh alayhi salatu salam there didn't remain in Lathalath except for three Arabia, wa Ibrania, wa Syriania. So three languages survived from the ancient times. And then the other languages they died off. Qabla al Islam. Okay. Uh, and so they died out before Islam came into the scene. So when Islam came to the scenes, Hebrew was there, Aramaic was there, Syriac was there, Arabic was there. And, and there were people who were masters in all of these languages. Uh, like uh, Khatija radiallahu anha, her, her cousin, كان يكتب Ibrania. He knew Arabic and he also knew Hebrew. So they knew the Semitic languages and they used them many times interchangeably with one another. And to show you the similarity, like for example, when I was, uh, you know, in 1994, I went to a uh, state of uh, Palestine, you can say. And when I was watching the TV, the Hebrew TV, yeah, they're words I can understand because they're so similar, the Semitic languages, right? And so, and now you're, you know, a person who is an Arab with a little bit of focus can understand Semitic languages like Hebrew and other languages. And people are trying to say, like Dr. Hani, one Arab can't understand another Arab. Are you like joking? Like it's true practically true but it is not true in like from an international from a language perspective it's not true at all because an educated Iraqi can speak classical language with an educated Egyptian okay and so if anybody who knows how to read a newspaper and 
read out loud a newspaper and understand a newspaper, those Arabs can all talk to each other just fine. Forget about he, uh, Aramaic and Hebrew and the other language. Even with that, you can have some understanding. So now take a look at Arabia, Ibrania, Suryania. Okay? Ana, ani, ana. Enta, ent, enta, enti, enti, hua, hua. Okay? Hia, hia, hia. Nahnu, nahnu. Uh, hanan. Antum, antum, antun, antunna. So like this. Okay? Hum, hum, hunun. Hunna, hinna, hinin. They have the plural of the feminine, the dual of the feminine, the dual of the male, the you, third person, second person, first person, all of that you, and this is basically saying you and he and uh, them, okay? So you can see this, how similar they are. So now people are trying to say, oh, Arabs can't understand Arabs? Are you joking? By the way, this is, uh, you know, ancient uh, Babylonia, which is, if you look at it, it's very similar to Arabic writing. But I'm not going to go into the writing part because it's it's hard to show. For example, the sheen, the three the three combs versus the sheen, for example. But of course, it has no dots and all of that. But it has some similarity to the Arabic language. It's very clearly it can be seen. Then he goes on to say, Al Arab, Ahlu hadhi lugha kaum malakul ard, walam tamlikuhum. He goes on to gray, falam yathir anhum shay'a. Min jahiliti, jahiliyatihim. They were in the desert, and no one wanted the desert. They were free to uh, retain their language, and they were free to bring about in a, a natural progression of this language to make it more classical, because they were living in nature, and no one was bothering them. No book had come to them. No, no, inf no influences were really happening to them. By by the time. Influences were coming. Arabic was already a well-established language. Okay, so but then he goes on to say, coming back to his original point, وَالَّذِي إِنْدَنَا أَنَّ الْمُرَادِ بِالْإِنْتِلَاقِ اللِّسَانِ إِسْمَعِيلِ بِالْعَرَبِي Okay, that Ismail alayhi salatu salam, he learned the language of Arabic. وَوْضِي أَسْلُهَا بِمَا أَضْعَافِ مِنْ لُغَةِ جُرْحَمْ إِلَى لُغَةَ قَوْمِهِ Okay, and he and the people of Durham who were living there, right? They all were they all were speaking this language with each other. Now he makes a very important point. He says, now Aswakul Arab, which is the marketplace of the Arabs. He refers to the verse of the Quran, Li ilafi Quraish ilafi shita wa saif. The travelings that they were doing, the Arabs, right? And when they would go, they would go to these famous marketplaces like Awqaf, which is very famous. Where the Prophet even went, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he heard many. Uh, like there was one particular person that I'm going to talk about later in another time, but the Prophet was also going to these marketplaces and where people were buying and selling, and these were international places where people were coming from the whole world, and they were have different locations where they would go, and these marketplaces would be where where the poets would meet, and the khutaba and the lecturers, the speakers, those that gave famous speeches they also met there and so it was uh, you know uh spoken word okay the creative spoken word that they would whether whether they did it in poetry or whether they did it in speeches and and this was what what happened because of that because they were traveling and the poets were going to the north and to the south to the winter the language was interconnected the arabic language was strongly interconnected because why business that was one big reason where they would meet and the language of the arabs was very well intricate and they understood each other the people even though they had differences the people from the south had differences from the people of the north but they all understood each other because why they're already used to many variations they're used to the different semitic languages in that they have their own local locution but they also have one language that is being developed that's very classical Okay, because who's in charge of these uh, these travels to the to the to the winter and the summer? It's the Quraysh. It's the most afsaha. It's the most eloquent of the Arabics. Okay, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But uh, just mentioning that the marketplace, uh, according to him, 
And one of these famous marketplaces, Uqad. Okay, Uqad is one of the marketplaces that played a great role of people coming together, buying and selling. They're naming new things. What is this called? Oh, okay. How much is this for? They're coming to the understanding of measurements. They're coming to the understanding of what to name things. They're coming to the understanding of the, 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 the buying and selling and transactions. And this is trade is where culture develops. And they're doing this with each other. And they're doing this internationally. And they're doing this with the, the Byzantine Empire. They're doing this with the Persian Empire. They're also coming and selling their things in these famous marketplaces that they had. One of the biggest international ones that they used to have was called Awqad. Okay? Uh, and then, uh, very important from here is, now, what were their, some of their differences? Okay? Min nawadir, of the rare things that they did differ on. Min nawadir ikhtalaf arab bi lughatihim li asbabil lisaniya. How did they differ with one another? Now he goes into great detail about showing how the Arab tribes, and he even names them. This tribe said this this way, and this tribe said this this way. Okay? So for example, I'm going to give you some examples. Okay? Instead of rudda mali, somebody would say ruddu. U instead of a ruddu or rudda mali. Okay. Uh, the ha of pronoun rudda ha. Okay. Or uh, umidda ha. They would uh, not say the pronoun. Do you say this the word without the pronoun rudda or uh, or uh, amidna? Okay. Uh, amidda or umuddu. Um, madda. They would take out the muddahu would become mudda according to some tribes. Some, some some tribes would say muddahu, others say mudda. Addahu adda. So this is the types of differences that they had. That Dr. Hani tries to make it like, oh, they were like speaking a different language. They didn't even understand each other. They couldn't even go to the marketplace and buy anything from each other. And they didn't under, understand each other's poetry. And they didn't have any interaction with one one another. This is how he makes it look like. Okay, so to da to so the ta instead of the alif. Okay, to da rir to Sorry, my um, dyslexia comes in my way sometimes, but it's very not not okay. Mistu versus uh, versus mistu or mis versus mustu mistu. Somebody, one tribe is saying mistu, the other tribe is saying mustu. The other tribe is, tribe is saying masastu. And so it's known, this tribe talked like this. And this tribe talked like this. And this tribe talked like this. They had differences. They had local locutions. But they also knew amongst themselves who is the most eloquent of speakers. Which is the most eloquent of this language. Like, for example, okay, uh, there might be some local uh, English language uh, that, for example, the Indians and Pakistanis speak, okay, uh, that they may know that's not, this is not the most eloquent way of speaking. Some people think the British speak the most eloquent English compared to, let's say, Australian or other versions of English. This It's understood which is the most eloquent. This is a part of a human quality that human beings have. Another famous difference, okay, is the wow. So isa'a or iya'a would be wasa, wasa, wasada or wa'a'a. Okay, hakada, like this. So there would be differences like this. He's enumerating all the differences of all the different tribes that they had with one another. Okay? Another thing that would happen is called, it's a type of adram, where you talk shorthand. Okay? So for example, uh, if somebody was saying Muzzaman from that time, he would say Mazzaman. Okay. Uh, so you brought you Munzuzaman, Mazzaman. Okay. So this this is how they made a shorthand. Like we say, um, we we say say Mafi Muh, but it's Mafihi Muh. Okay. So like this. Uh, even this is used today. This shorthand. Style is used even today in colloquial language. 
but it was it's understood if you say mafi moch it means mafi himoch but you say mafi moch in colloquial but if you're writing it okay you're going to most likely write mafi himoch and this is one point dr hani etchen should consider but uh and that is that he says look it's very interesting he's bringing up how the Jahiliya poetry and how the language was at that time of the Prophet, how it actually showed Qur'an as a miracle, okay? So, for example, نَذَرَ إِبْنْ ذَرِيد فِي كِتَابُهُ جَمْحَرْ إِلَى مَوَاقِ الْحَرُوفِ فِي الْكَلَامِ الْعَرَبِ اِعْتَبَارِ أَسْبَابُ He talks about how أَنَّ أَكْثَرَ الْحَرُوفِ إِسْتِمَعْلًا إِنْدَهُمْ وَاو The most often word that they used in their language before the Qur'an was revealed, was wow and ya yeah and hamza. And the least that was used, right, uh, it says, uh, the, the least of them was meme. Now when you look at the Qur'an, what's the, length, what's the letter that's used most in Qur'an? is meme, right? Many of the ayat, a large percent of even the ayat, end with meme. Okay, so... It's not like the, it's from his perspective. The, the person that Dr. Hani says is an expert from his perspective. There, is, there are many advantages of having this Jahidiyya poetry to be able to compare it with Quran. Okay? And uh, he... Dr. Hani has nothing to compare Quran to by his methodology. Because the Quran is uh, self-sufficient within itself, which is 100% Quran, correct. The Quran is self-sufficient within itself. But is it not using letters of Arabic? Is it not using words of Arabic? Okay, so the thing is, if it is, then it gives you something comparative to be able to see that it's a miracle. And, of course, if he says, well, there are many Arabics, well, we're going to come to that point in a little bit. This is an important point, but uh, may not 100% relate, but he says, وَصِيغَةُ الْأَفَالِ مَعْرُوفَ فِي اللُّغَاتِ الثَّلَاثَةِ In the three languages, they all have the same, basically, if I put it in very simple terms, he's saying the, 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 the grammar of these three languages uh, that are Syriac and uh, Aramaic and uh, Hebrew and uh, Arabic, their, their, their grammar is very similar. Okay? Uh, and this is because of its association with Bab Babaliya, he says. Okay? And over here he compares Arabic, Arabiya, Isra, Is, Syriania, Ibraniya. He compares their verbs. Fa'ala, he did. Okay? Between, and it's different. Uh, there are 14 different ways of saying he did because it's she did, they did, he did, all that. Okay? And so uh, he compares them and to show that how, how similar they are. Now he's going to talk about the letters, okay, the letters of the Arabic alphabet. And why? Because the sound is made from the letters. And we know in Arabic language that we have a complete science of letters. We know where each letter comes from. Mim comes from the lips. Three letters. We call haruf shaf uh, shafatain. The mim, the waw, okay, the ba, they come from the lips. And we know where each letter comes from. So in the Arabic language, not, not only does the Arabic language give you the word, but it tells you where the letters of those words will be pronounced from in the mouth. Okay? And what are the qualities of those letters? That when you say them, do you let out air? Do you say them harshly? Do you say them with a full tongue? Do you say them with a light tongue? Do you say, Lillahi versus Allahi? When is the lamb, for example, heavy? When is the lamb light? When is the raw heavy, right? When is the raw heavy? When is the raw light? Where did all these rules come from? They came from the language of the Arabic language that then later on get applied to the reading of the Quran. And so, the, um, so, so he has a whole chapter on Haruf al Arabiya, the letters of the Arabic language. And where and what are their qualities and where they come out from in your mouth? And he'll say like jim and sheen, how they have similar qualities, and sod, 
right? And and he goes with each letter describing there, you can say uh, the different types of letters and how they're said from the different parts of the mouth. So now this is a language, especially the Quran, right? The Quran has a specific way of being recited. But the specific way it has been recited in saying, okay, this is how Ra is read, this is how Lam is read, this is how this letter is read. It's not just Quran. This was understood even amongst the Arabs when they would do their, for example, their poetry. Of course, Quran added new rules to this that were different from the poetry. Okay, But they knew the quality of the letters. So this man who says, oh, they didn't, Oh, Arabic languages, many languages. What, what are you talking about? A person reading Quran in Russia who understands Quran in the Arabic language, just as I do. Another person understanding Quran, just as I do, in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, and different places of the world. We, it's the same language. What are you talking about? And you're not doing any, any good to Islam by saying that, oh, no, there are many Arabs. You're just giving to the whole colonialist view and agenda when you say that. It is what you're trying to do. This whole discussion here, um, you know, on number six, Sa'at al kasin. So, for example, when you say Sirat al-Mustaqim versus Sirat al-Mustaqim, right? So, the scene, the scene, when you say scene, you have to smile, like scene. Sa'at, you don't smile. It's a heavy tongue. So, these maharaj, there are places where you articulate the letters from. Some idiot is going to tell you that the person who is reading Quran, okay, or writing classical Arabic is going, they're all going to articulate the letters from where that language tells you to articulate those letters. And it is known as the classical language. Even the Arabs of that time understood that. So I'm going to come to that in just a little bit. He has a whole chapter on just safat, the qualities of the letters and maharaj, maharajiha, and its places of articulation. Just a whole section where he discusses of the different tribes and their differences and how those letters are said. And then, but, right, ikhtalafat lughat al-Arab, and how they differ, disagree. And then he goes into some more details about uh, how they said certain words in a certain way. So how they said gaf instead of jim, okay? And then he goes to the next afsahu al qabail, who were the most eloquent in speaking, okay? And he even quotes a quotation of the Prophet sallallahu here, ana afsahu al-Arab, I'm the most eloquent of the Arabic speakers. So uh, Dr. Hani didn't read this book, gave it as a uh, as a evidence in his speech there are many arabic languages this person completely disagrees with him and goes on to prove that even the letters have the same because he starts with his premises language is what what is sound and what is heard being meaningful and he goes into the history of the arabic language from babylonia arcadia this the sister languages of the arabic okay how they have the same grammar they're part of the same family literally part of the same family Okay, the tribes did disagree on, or disagrees, but they had variations, they had different locutions on how to speak. But they also had the same marketplace where they would compete in the spoken word, and it was well known who are the people who are the most eloquent. And it was well known what is eloquent language versus not eloquent language. Everybody understands the street language versus classical and eloquent and uh, polished language versus unpolished language. Everybody understood this. In the time of the Prophet, they understood it, and we understand it today. Okay? And so, kind of like this, uh, this myopic view, uh, this linear view, of, linear view of language, that as if language doesn't have taste, and doesn't have uh, eloquence, and that somehow human beings can't understand uh, or cannot appreciate eloquence. When the Prophet is saying, Arab, and he's quoting, who's quoting? I'm not saying this. He's saying that the people of Mecca had the most eloquent of Arabic. And then he goes and describes each of the tribes and saying, okay, these were the people that had very eloquent language. These are the people that didn't have such eloquent language. And he goes on and on discussing this. So now, uh, the point being that Dr. Hani Echen, I've seen this more than one time now, 
and I'm going to download his other books where he gives his references. But this is one of the references that he gave and made a big deal about. Oh, there's so many Arabics. There's no so many Arabics. There's only one Arabic. It doesn't take, uh, it, 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 even, even a child can understand that if, if you teach a child the basic Arabic language, okay, if you teach him a basic Arabic language and pick up books from different parts of the Arab world and he can read the stories of, let's say, Adam and Nuh, one written in Egypt, one written in Beirut, one written in Syria, one written, he can pick up and read those books. It's the same language. It's, it's the sounds being made and how you're understanding them. That is Arabic language. And the Quran was the most eloquent of that. Quran came to Mecca because Mecca was the best place to challenge that. And how were they going to challenge that? They were going to challenge that when there was already competition. Like Musa came to compete against magic. Jesus came to compete against healing. Okay, so Quran came to compete against spoken word. But you don't have the ability to appreciate that because you have a methodology that works consistently internally, even though you misuse it, completely misuse it. But even the references you give as an evidence to make the point that what? That, oh, there are many Arabic languages. No, this person did not say there are many Arabic languages. In fact, he says that it's all going back to Adam. It's all going back to Babylonia. And these are all just basically sister languages, the other languages with it. They all come from Sam. Okay, And the Arabs, they knew what is eloquent language. They had differences amongst themselves. And they were able to appreciate the eloquence of the Quran and that was what reinforced that type of language. So I think that, and let me go back to, just just to give you how uh, weak Dr. Hani's arguments are and unintelligent his arguments are. Let me mention again, you know, from the very, he, this person starts his book with what? The most thing, the thing that no one can, no even Qur'ani Yun, not even Qur'ani Yun who know Arabic will agree with him on this. Bismik Allahumma. Allah, I start in your name. It's the same language that a sister language is Arabic. Elohim. Him here is plural of respect and it is plural of all his attributes in his name. Oh Allah. And then he continues. Allahumma, Allahumma, O oh Allah, by all, faj'al kitabi min is, ismika fa'idha, and, and then, by your name, Allah, by your name, make my book a benefit, okay? And this is the book, the person who uses Allahumma in the beginning doing dua to Allah, make this book beneficial to other people, is the book Dr. Hani is using to say, oh, this person said there are many Arabic languages. When he said the complete, he was saying the complete opposite. Complete opposite. So what does that say tell you about, I don't want to say intellectual dishonesty. Maybe he was so biased that he read it and just saw one or these differences and said, oh, see, Arabic locutions were different. Therefore, there's no air, air, there are many Arabics. Yeah, there are many Arabic locutions, but there's a classical Arabic. And this is something that's very human. In every language, there's different locutions, but then there's a classical form. This very basic thing. But he uses this very basic thing to make the point that, oh, oh no, the, the people of the, the prophet was conveying this message to a people who didn't really understand what he was trying to say. And this is not really Arabic that the prophet was speaking. It's a different Arabic. You know, I mean, this is just a great intellectual dishonesty for to use this man as a reference for your point because he doesn't even come close to saying what you're saying. Not even close. So I hope, inshallah, Allah guides Dr. Hani and those that are with him, guide them, inshallah ta'ala. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides all of us because we all need guidance. There's no one in the world that doesn't need guidance. We all need guidance. So may Allah guide all of us. And uh, may Allah open us all to the right way. Okay? <laughs>